I'm Kevin Werbeck. Uh, I know many of you. I am a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, I also, in, in full disclosure, uh, have a, a consulting engagement with the FCC. Um, but here I'm, I'm speaking purely on my own. Uh, this is an event that is uh, jointly hosted by the Wharton School and by the Berkman Center for Internet and Society at uh, Harvard University. Uh, my colleague, Yochai Benkler, um, is the co-organizer of the event. He'll speak in just a minute. Um, our topic today is the FCC's authority over broadband internet access. Uh, this is a critically important topic. Broadband is, at a minimum, one of the great infrastructure projects of our era, uh, and in many ways, something much more than that. In many ways, it's a fundamental platform for the way that we'll interact and already are interacting with our families, our communities, our work environment, our government. So the question about the regulation of broadband, the question about uh, how the FCC, Congress, other parts of the federal government relate to broadband access is a, is a critically important one uh, in a whole variety of areas, as I'm sure all of you know. Um, and the immediate uh, context uh, for this event uh, was the decision uh, in April by the DC Circuit Court of Appeals rejecting the FCC's legal theory for uh, sanctioning Comcast network management practices for their broadband access service. Uh, shortly after that decision, uh, Yochai and I started talking, uh, and our sense was that uh, there was a critical issue here about where things would go forward, uh, a critical open question about what legal authority the FCC had, what uh, trajectory the commission would take about broadband under the statute, uh, and how this would play out. Um, so we started putting this together. We felt that uh, there, were, there were open questions and we needed an event to talk about it. Um, the response has been really outstanding. As we'll see in a minute, we've got an extraordinary group of speakers from a wide range of perspectives here. Um, subsequent to that, uh, Chairman Janikowski at the FCC announced uh, his proposal, the so-called third way, a direction to move forward uh, under Title II of the statute uh, on broadband authority. And then uh, just this week, the uh, chairman of the major uh, committees in the House and Senate put out an announcement uh, about uh, initiating a look at some of these issues and potentially revamping the Telecommunications Act. So um, we're proud to take full credit for all of those developments since we uh, started putting this together. Um, but we felt like there were still some open questions. There's still some very important issues, both about the legal uh, dimensions of how things go forward as, as well as the substance. Uh, so that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, I, I want to welcome all of you. I'm going to moderate both of the sessions. Uh, I'll just uh, bring up uh, my co-host, uh, Yochai Bankler, to say a few introductory words, and then we'll go into the first panel. So um, do you have this? Uh, so um, first of all, uh, it's uh, to say welcome to everyone uh, for coming here. Uh, and to say how pleased we are to be able to co-host this uh, with the Wharton School and with Kevin. Um, uh, uh, the effort to try to come from academia and provide a platform for uh, an objective and diverse set of views about a set of questions is I think something that, that we both were trying to do and I think is important because these are, as Kevin uh, said, really important issues. The only piece of context that I'd like to add is to zoom uh, uh, to the 10-year level instead of to the three months or the four months level and to understand that one of the things that's happening uh, that is uh, involved in, in the transition that we're in now is that we're in a decadal moment in a sense, somewhat akin to the first broadband transition from dial-up to broadband when we talk about next generation uh, networks. And whether it's that the speeds of the wired connections are massively greater, that the investment structure, be it in DOCSIS 3.0 or in fiber, uh, is different and requires new uh, investments that are different and perhaps different on both sides, whether it's the question of the degree to which at long last wireless uh, uh, and ubiquitous access will really replace and displace, these are the questions that come together with this idea of next generation connectivity that is, uh, seen to be quite widely by people looking at uh, policy to be a, a, a phase change, like the first uh, broadband transition was. And so in the context of this moment that is both 
in the market and the technology a phase shift and in the politics potentially a phase shift, being able to provide a platform for talking about whether the FCC should or shouldn't, can or can't, uh, seem to us uh, to be a good idea on this longer term. And so uh, thrilled to have everyone here and thrilled to have this collaboration uh, to do it with. Terrific. So a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, please put your mobile phones on stun. And uh, we are uh, recording this. We're not streaming the video live, but we are recording the video, and we'll make it available on our website. So um, we will take questions for both of the panels. Uh, when we do take questions, we'll have to ask you to wait until the mic comes around so we get you on the video. So without further ado, let me bring up the, uh, the first panel, and then uh, we'll get started. So as, as uh, both Yochai and I said, we're, we're really thrilled uh, to have uh, a, a group of people who are uh, experts on these issues, as well as in many cases people who have uh, first-hand knowledge and been involved in the development of, of uh, the debate around the FCC and broadband for many years. Uh, uh, in some ways, this is an issue that's, that's come to a head in the last few months, but it has a history that goes back uh, at least 15 years at the FCC in terms of looking at the question of uh, the internet and how it relates to uh, the FCC's regulatory authority under the statute, uh, and in some ways well before that. So the first panel we wanted to look at the history and context of the debate. Um, because it, it, it's easy if you're, if you're focused on the immediate political fights uh, to think that this is something that just sprang up uh, yesterday, uh, but the, the history is important and uh, I think it, it will inform some of the discussions about where we should go forward. Uh, the three people we have on the panel, I'll just uh, briefly introduce them. I know uh, many of you know, know them very well. Uh, John Nakahata is a partner at uh, the DC law firm of Wiltshire and Granis, uh, where he, he practices uh, in telecommunications, uh, internet, cable regulation. Um, he uh, spent several years at the FCC uh, between 1995 and 1998. Um, and his bio actually says he was one of the principal architects of the FCC's implementation of the 1996 Telecom Act. So uh, we have John to blame for any of these problems. Um, uh, he served in a number of roles at the commission, including uh, chief of staff uh, for uh, then Chairman Bill Kennard, um, which was at, at uh, one of the, the turning points when uh, some of the questions about broadband first uh, started to come by the agency's radar screen. Uh, next to John, we have Jessica Rosenworcel. Um, Jessica also spent time at the Commission in the, the Wireline Bureau and then as a legal advisor to Commissioner Michael Copps um, and now serves uh, as the uh, Senior Telecommunications Counsel uh, to the U.S. Senate Commerce Committee, uh, which uh, oversees the FCC. And finally, uh, to her left, uh, John Winhausen. Uh, John, actually, I didn't even realize, it turns out, was at the Commission as well in the, in the 1980s. Um, I, I first uh, encountered him uh, subsequently when uh, he was in Congress um, working uh, as a counsel to the Democrats on the Senate Commerce Committee uh, during the period uh, in which the 1996 Telecom Act was drafted. So John uh, was actually involved in the, the drafting of the statute that still applies today. So uh, if, if this John is not at fault, then you certainly are. Uh, <laughs> uh, subsequently, John uh, served as general counsel of the Competition Policy Institute and president of uh, the Association for Local Telecommunications Service and now has a private consulting firm. So let me uh, start by asking a, a question to, to all three of you, and then we can take it in turn. I guess we'll start with John. Um, so here we are, 14 years after the 1996 Telecom Act, uh, at a point in time when broadband is not just something that's available to a few people, but is, is something that a, a majority of Americans, I believe at this point, subscribe to. How is it that we've gotten to this point that we're still debating this basic initial question about the FCC's legal authority? Bijan or that John? Oh, John, just, uh, John Nakahata. I'm sorry, we bad bad panelist selection. But uh. actually, it might, be, it might make sense to start with John Windhaus, and but but the because of the in some ways this, the reason why we're debating it goes back to the I think goes back to the statute and goes back to the fact that the act itself wasn't written at a time when the internet is something we didn't have we didn't have the internet as we know it. It was something that was primarily drafted. 
I mean, it, a lot of the drafting of the, of the Telecom Act occurs in the 1993-94 time frame, which, to put that in internet context, is roughly coincident with the introduction of the internet browser. Um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a different, the Telecom Act is a creature of a different world. And that became pretty apparent pretty quickly as the FCC began, began to try to grapple with how do you apply statutory, how do you, how do you apply the statutory definitions um, to the world of the Internet? And not surprisingly, there were two different views coming out of the Congress. Um, and if you wanted to the, the, uh, define the, find the definition of being in a bad position in Washington terms, uh, the FCC was caught in the one sense between a very deregulatory Commerce Committee chairman, Senator McCain, who said, well, I think that these, these Internet services are should be treated as unregulated services, and a very universal service concerned chairman of the Appropriations Committee, Senator Stevens, who took the view that, in fact, uh, any Internet services or that these, especially on the internet access services and really even things like email, all involved transmission and so involved the provision of transmission to the public and therefore were telecommunication services. So the question has always come down to what, the question we've been, reason we've been dealing with these questions for 14 years and that they're unresolved is that they've been, or in some ways got resolved and then have been unresolved since then, or re-unresolved. Re is that there is that the statute doesn't speak to it, and that it's a very they're, they're, the, the 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 answers are not are neither obvious uh, and, and nor nor clearly spelled out. John Winans, is that is that your recollection too? Well, yes and no. Um, I'll introduce a, a different perspective on it right away, perhaps for the sake of debate. Um, the way I see this, well, let me let me say put it this way. Um, the debate that we're talking about now really started 30, 35 years ago uh, as the FCC struggled with this decision about how to separate the regulated telecommunications or communications functions from the unregulated enhanced services, uh, information services that was started uh, really in the 1970s with the Computer 1, then Computer 2, and then Computer 3 decisions. Um, and I suspect that uh, we're still going to be debating those questions even 30, 35 years from now. Uh, because I think what we've got here, and stepping back, trying to look at a, a bigger picture, you've got two very important principles that uh, we all agree on, I think, uh, in terms of the principles. One is that you need to have the principle of common carriage, which I, I know takes some hits as a uh, 19th century uh, holdover. It actually goes back much further than that in history. It's, and the reason it goes back is it's sort of, in my view, in the category, not the same, but it's in the same category as things like free speech and First Amendment. It's a fundamental principle that if you're going to be offering communications to the general public, you ought to do so in a non-discriminatory way. So that's one important principle. There's another very equally important, equally important principle, which is that you don't need to regulate stuff that doesn't need to be regulated. So if you've got information services that are being offered on a competitive basis and there are low barriers to entry and anyone, entrepreneurs, can get into that marketplace, well, you don't need to regulate that set of services. And that's, those two principles are equally strong, equally valid, and the question I think that the FCC started to investigate 30, 35 years ago was how do you draw the boundary line between those? The 1996 Act really tried to capture that debate and, I, and, and is very consistent with the computer inquiry lines of decisions, and I think you could say that the debate that we're having now, the reason that we're still debating these issues is that issue of how do you draw that boundary line is still relevant today. So one way I look at the current debate as we're now embarked on computer four. Right. Jessica, your turn. Um, well, let me put it more simply from a legislative perspective. Technology just moves at such a fast clip right now that our legislative and regulatory models, they struggle to keep pace. And you can imagine that when the Telecommunications Act was written, there was no one who was really contemplating the ubiquity of broadband service. There was probably nobody who thought that there'd be 280 some odd million wireless handsets available in the marketplace. And 
consumers' hands or that in their palms they'd be able to access the internet, much less that the computer screen would be fusing with the television screen. And all of those changes are tremendously exciting for consumers, but they pose significant challenges for regulators and legislators, and that's what really what we're struggling with right now. Well, let me just push on that. It's, it's, I mean, it, it, it's certainly true that, that uh, the Congress is not a professional futurist society, and, and, and even, even some of us who were, were very tech savvy in, in the mid-1990s didn't anticipate everything that was going to happen. But um, I mean, is it really the case that, that this world is totally foreign to anything that Congress could have imagined? Either John? Um. Let, let's uh, again go back to the to the '96 Act a little bit and sort of set the stage here. Um, a, a lot of what happened in the lead up to the 1996 Act, uh, we have to keep in mind, was uh, the effort to take communications policy away from Judge Green, and so a predominant uh, motivational force behind the 1996 Act was to say that the courts should not be running communications policy; it really should be the expert government agency, the FCC. And this was, again, one of those universal things that applied across the boundary lines, Republicans and Democrats. If there is one thing that everybody agreed on, it's that Congress and the FCC should be making policy, not, not a, a single federal judge. So you had so many uh, members of Congress saying from both sides of the aisle that the FCC is the expert agency. We really need to have restore the authority back with the FCC because they're the ones that have the technical expertise. And you know how it is in Congress. You start saying this enough, enough over and over again. You actually be, begin to believe it. And so you had members on both sides of the aisle saying that the FCC was the proper location to restore this authority and to be making these technical decisions. Um, this is not a place that Congress is very uh, capable of addressing changes in technology. Um, and so, yes, there were huge technological developments that occurred uh, since 1996 Act to, uh, to today. What we were trying to do in the 1996 Act is to recodify some of those basic principles that would carry us forward uh, into the next century so that we wouldn't have to keep going back to Congress for legislative changes every few years based on technological changes. What we wanted to do is to give the FCC the authority to exercise its judgment about how those technological changes should fit within the policy framework that was being set up. So Kevin, I, I don't know if that exactly answers your question, but that's hopefully a, a bit of perspective. Anyone else have a perspective on that? I, it, I don't know that it, that it couldn't have been foreseen, but there were certainly roads not taken. And so if we, I mean, if we, if we think back to, 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 to the 1994, 95 timeframe, um, Clearly in the air was the notion that the, 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 the existing Communications Act structure, in, to put it in more, to date more you know, well, these parlance that Kevin created, um, was, was more oriented towards silos of applications than, in, than, than, than layers of functionality. Uh, and so you didn't, it did, you didn't really, I mean, well, well Computer 2, the computer, computer inquiry decisions, I think, were very much premised on a notion of trying to separate a transmission layer, which would be a basic layer and, a, and sort of a common carrier service, from a from a applications layer, which would be the information or enhanced service. Um, that wasn't totally mirrored in the, in the structure in the structure of the act, and particularly in the focus on common carriage, and and the cable industry, in some ways leapfrog the development of the regulation because the cable industry as a non-common carrier began offering both an integrated tra transmission and information service combination. Um, the road not taken at the time was it, it, sort of early on, uh, Vice President Gore floated the notion of Title VII. And do you need to re sort of recreate, would, would there need to be a different um, set of statutory provisions, and I'm not saying that his necessarily were right, but I mean, but a different set of statutory provisions that would apply to a, uh, an I, an sort of a, even IP is probably not the right word to put on it, so even that is sort of recasting it, looking backwards, but a, 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 and I will use that term for now, an IP world, um, where uh, the transmission network would be capable of all different ranges of applications, video, voice, um, data, 
And that was, that was the road, that was really the road not taken, and the choice was, the choice was to, main, to stay, with, stay working within the kind of application-centric uh, framework that, that, that was set up by the, night, that, by the 34 Act. And I think that is, that is what we continue to struggle with today. And, and it's, it's frankly what, you know, I think, I, I think you see with, 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 the, with the members saying, we may need to go back and look at this again. So what we did get in the statute was this, the, these two categories, telecommunications and information service. So, so let me just, just as each of you, I mean, how, how, what do you make of, what, what do those mean? Fundamentally, what's the, what's the import of that distinction? Uh, well, it, get, it gets back to that fundamental, these two principles that uh, I talked about earlier about what should be and, and should not be regulated. Um, you know, we did base the decisions and the definitions of telecommunication services and information services based on the computer two and computer three lines of decisions coming out of the FCC. Um, I know a lot of people said, well, why didn't you use basic and enhanced as the terminology then? Why did you use the, M the, the telecommunication services and information services language? Because, and that the reason is because we were abrogating the MFJ. We were abrogating the court decision that used those terms. So we had to use that terminology so that it was clear that we were taking the authority away from the judge. But we also wanted to use the definitions that the FCC had used because we were handing it to the FCC. We wanted to build on the body of work that the FCC had done so far. And, and that was the effort to try to uh, uh, identify that, those, those two lines of thought. Um, I know that we, uh, uh, th there are some vague provisions in the 1996 Act. Um, I will agree to that, and certainly we've taken some hits from that, uh, about that, and, uh, including from the Supreme Court. Um, but I, I would also say that some of that was not just an oversight, that it was actually uh, intentional on our part not to decide some of these questions because, again, we, d we did want to leave these to the FCC so that it could adapt its regulatory process to the changes in technology. Um, and so, the, but those, those two competing, those, those two terms really capture the two different philosophies, those two different core beliefs that are, again, I think are, are both accurate and valid and, and, and why that debate is going to continue probably not just now but for many years to come. Jessica, I mean, do you think it's a, it's a, it's a fundamental d distinction or, or, or something specific to the statute? Well, as John mentioned, you can go back to Computer 2 to look for the distinction between basic and enhanced services, which was roughly mirrored in the Telecommunications Act with telecommunication services and information services. And that construct has been useful, but as we approach a world where we have many more services, many more service providers, we are seeing a degree of functional integration that is making the application of those two binary constructs much more difficult. And I think that's what we're grappling with right now. I, I would just add uh, in a note that I think John got it right uh, with the Stevens report uh, that interpreted uh, the statutory provisions when the Stevens report issued by the FCC came out and said, yes, the 96 Act terms were meant to build off of the computer two and computer three lines of decision. Yeah, so that's, that's a good segue. I don't know, did you want to jump in with that? I, I wanted to get into sort of now, let's, let's talk, let's move forward how the FCC has, has interpreted this. Or did you want to add something first, John? Or? No. Okay. okay well, so, well, you're, but, well, let me start with you then. So, so 1997, the FCC issued the so-called Stevens you know, report, report to Congress, um, and then uh, ultimately began the process of uh, classifying broadband services. When you were there under under Chairman Kennard, started started the process of looking at uh, cable modem service, uh, and then uh, completed the decision under under Chairman Powell and, and Chairman Martin. Um, so what was, what was the agency trying to accomplish, and what was the agency concerned about uh, in going down that path? Well, I, I mean, the, the, I mean, the context of the, the, the Stevens Report came up, obviously, in, it was called the Stevens Report because it was created by a, 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 uh, a, an appropriations writer authored by Senator Stevens, um, whose focus very much was on universal service and maintaining the stability of the Universal Service Fund and who was very concerned, and whose staff was very concerned, that if, if, the, if, if, you, if the scope of services as, on which universal service was assessed was not extremely broad, the technology would find ways to flow around those definitions, and ultimately the, the scope of uh, 
uh, assess services would shrink. Um, not unreasonable concern. In fact, it's probably been proved out to some extent. Um, but you know, and it was predictable, also, frankly. Uh, so that was that was sort of what was the, the motivating concern. But but it, the larger issue was what John what John Windhausen, I think, was averting to too. We had there was a very strong notion that the internet was growing up in, in an un, in a fairly unregulated space, um, not and. The, and that that was a good thing. It was there was a lot of there was a lot of development. People did not need to ask permission to launch new internet serv internet based services. The other part of it that was positive was from a public policy perspective. Really, was internationally this was a force that was breaking down the power of the PTT, the international PTTs. Um, the, 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 the government post government owned telephone telephone post and telecommunications yeah. services. Um, and the and monopolist, the, the national monopolists in each in each country, and I think if you remember back to the you know, early 90s, um, international calling was extremely expensive, and there were many different ways that international calling was calling rates were brought down, including some efforts by the FCC in terms of sort of force using the the, the U.S.'s uh, volume of traffic as a way to to force down what were called settlement rates. But another reason, part of that was opening up all, lots of different alternatives, whether it be resale or the internet, as ways to flow around the facilities that were created by the by the by the national monopolies. And it's not at all surprising that that VoIP service, for example, and in the Stevens Stevens report talks about, if you remember, a company called IDT. And what IDT was doing was providing a way for people, and not unlike Skype today, was providing a way for people to talk to people to friends and, and business associates in other countries using the internet and going around the, the national PTT structure and the, uh, and the international national settlement structure. That was something that, that that was important to maintain. It was an important downward pressure on an artificial monopoly structure that was propped up through the ITU. Um, it's all, frankly also was important to maintain this. The other part about the internet is that as value-added services, and not being subject to national licensing regimes, people were trying, were, being, were, try, were entering and getting into countries without having to get governmental approval. That was a democratizing force. You know, you did not need to get the permission of the government necessarily to bring in the internet. That was all. all these were all benefits of having it be unregulated, the internet being an unregulated, unregulated service. Now, none of this was really fully doctrinally resolved, right? As I said, you know, the, the notion of computer two was you had a regulated transmission layer, and that was a common carrier service and you had an unregulated information services applications layer that rode over that transmission layer that was that that but anybody could buy the transmission layer from the basic from the basic service provider and that was a, a very simple and elegant concept and construct the problem was that it, the problem was it didn't necessarily match reality that there were certainly transmission providers that were not common carriers, cable being the most prominent example among them, but not the only example, the other example being internet backbone providers. So um, the, commission was, if, if the commission says, well, if we're, if we're going to declare all transmission to be common carriers, which was the, uh, the point of view that was being pushed by Senators Stevens and Burns at that point in time, it's faced a fairly unpalatable choice of, you know, are we saying that anybody who, who moves bits is going to be a common carrier and going to have to be licensed? Okay, so, so essentially the agency had a choice of saying either we're going to pull a whole lot of stuff on the internet uh, up to the, the level that the, the historically regulated uh, incumbent telephone companies, or we're going to take a whole lot of stuff and, and push it down to this lightly or unregulated tier of what's under information services. That's, that, 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 that from, a stat, from a statutory yeah. classification perspective, okay. yes. The, uh, the interesting thing was the answer of Senator Stevens and Burns was, in fact, the third way. 
So if you look at paragraph 47 of the Stevens report, it's in response to this concern, Senator Stevens and Burns maintained that co commission could rely on its forbearance authority under section 10 to resolve any such problems. <laughs> this sounds awfully familiar. <laughs> um, and I don't mean that to poke, uh, to poke fun at, 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 at um, Chairman Janikowski or at, 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 at um, at Austin Schlick, because never, never, it, never a good idea to no, because, because frankly, that, all it means is that I'm getting old, right? I mean, <laughs> the definition of old is in Washington is when when you've seen the seen the thing, everything come around for at least the second time, if not the third. So, <laughs> all right. Well, let me let, let me ask the, the other two people on the panel for, for your take on this. Do you do you, do you think that that we're this is the, the same issue um, and, and, and that, that we were dealing with then? Um, uh, I mean, it's very similar. Uh, it's just a, an upgrade with the technology, and uh, the technology is going to continue to change. So I, I think we're still going to be uh, trying to uh, answer these questions in the future. It, it is interesting, though, to go down memory lane and revisit some of those uh, debates at that time that the Stevens report was being discussed, because then you, you were in a situation where all of the, the telephone industry was asking the FCC to regulate the Internet. There, because of this concern about VoIP that John uh, referred to, not just internationally but also domestically, VoIP carriers were seen as providing a very similar service to traditional telephone service, and yet they weren't paying universal service charges in the same way that traditional phone companies were. So there was a, there was a lot of effort to, by, by the industry to say assert regulatory jurisdiction here over voice over the internet technology. So these things tend to go in cycles uh, around and around. Uh, you know, even back further, there was something called the interspan service that AT&T was offering in the 70s, where it was commingling common carrier services with data processing services. And the question was, well, how should that be regulated? Uh, is there a contamination theory here that should say as soon as you uh, attach a single uh, information service to a, a telecom component that the whole thing becomes information services? Well, well, no, the, the FCC rejected that, and maybe one example of why is, uh, for instance, voicemail. You know, you wouldn't want to take a basic pure telephone service and slap voicemail onto it and then say, okay, now the whole thing is unregulated. But yet, on the other hand, if you are integrating telecommunications just as a subcomponent to an overall information services package, at some point, yes, it does become uh, more fitting to move it in the information services and unregulated category. So that's why these issues keep, uh, you know, have a long history and they're going to continue to have a future with us as well. I think what you hear thematically is that there's an effort to try, despite the statute, to treat like services the same. And when you look back over the last decade, you see in 2002, the FCC classified cable modem services as an information service and then on the heels of the Brand X decision from the Supreme Court, chose to reclassify wireline broadband information access service as an information service and then subsequently did something similar in 2006 with broadband over power line and then um, walked over to the wireless side and did the same in 2007. So there's an effort, notwithstanding the statute, to try to treat similar services the same, particularly if they are fungible from a consumer perspective. But it is challenging because the statute was not built for that kind of treatment. And so there is an effort to try to figure out how to harmonize these services and their treatment, perhaps in, despite what the law actually calls for as it was uh, enacted. So what, if anything, has changed? Uh, I mean, John, John mentioned one thing in, in the environment in terms of the, the concern, uh, it, it particularly in the, in the late 90s, about the international uh, effects of what the FCC might do. Um, Clearly, technology is advanced. Broadband is more widespread. Are, are there any differences fundamentally from uh, when the FCC was initially considering this, or or, or not? Well, the marketplace continues to change, sure. And and one of the evaluations that the FCC has to be engaged in is a continual analysis of that marketplace to see where the market power may be. Uh, where there's an opportunity for certain providers to gain an unfair advantage in the marketplace or discriminate against others. That is a constantly changing analysis that, that has to be done. So, and John, John Nakahara is right in some ways that we didn't really have a full understanding in 1996 
of, of what the internet was going to be and what the technology is. Now, it wasn't that we were clueless at that stage. Uh, I, I do remember when we passed the, the uh, uh, Telecom Act out of the Senate in 1995, where we dealt with long distance entry and, and abrogating the MFJ and burglar alarms and HDTV and all these hundreds of provisions. The headline in the Washington <coughs> Post when the act passed the Senate was the Senate acts to um, uh, uh, regulate indecency on the internet. That was the headline. That was the one thing that the Washington Post picked out and it was very clearly uh, that you know we knew the internet was there. We didn't know about broadband, but we we did have a section 706 which began to sort of talk about advanced services. So we had an inkling of what was going on and what was going to happen, but we didn't really fully appreciate uh, you know the tremendous uh, demand for broadband services and the tremendous growth in those services. Um, and so that is what's changed. I mean, we need to really have a regulatory regime that um, does. Uh, respect the fact that broadband is, well, taking over the world, that's probably too strong, uh, but it is going to become the predominant way of communicating uh, in the future. Well, so one, one thing that has changed, at least in the, in the regulatory structure, is we, we talked about Computer 2, Computer 3, and, and those rules, those FCC rules were in force when these decisions were made in the late 90s and, and have largely been Abandoned. The, the FCC also uh, chose to, to eliminate uh, line sharing requirements in the in the 2003, I believe, triennial review. Did, did, did any of those changes make a substantial difference in terms of the, the context for deciding this broadband authority question? I'm not sure whether those things make 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 a clear difference. It, it, it does shape the doctrinal discussion a little bit in the mm -hmm. sense that. There is no, um, well, I mean, going back to the definition of common carrier services thing, which everybody's, which is fam famously circular, um, but even in the DC Circuit's articulation of it, one of the prongs for being a common carrier service is that you were required to be a common ser carrier service, which always struck me as being the ultimate and circular, too. Um, <laughs> is that there's nobody, there's nobody who's really required to provide transmission on a standalone basis anymore. Um, you can elect to provide it. You can elect to provide it on a standalone basis, or you can choose to provide it on an integrated basis, and that's probably di that's differently different than 1999. Um, the, or the but the other difference, clear difference in the marketplace is, or, or maybe not difference, may, evolution in the marketplace maybe a better way to put it is the there is the the robustness of multiple facilities-based players, um, both on the wire, on the wired side with, with cable sort of emerging in its, in it, in it, in, and really actually being the predominant broadband medium, but also with significant development on the, on the telephone, on the, on the traditional telco side, and then with the, with the growth of, of wireless services, which substitute to some, to at least some, to, to at least some extent. I also have a view on that. Okay. Well, then let, 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 let's fast forward a little bit. So, uh, as I believe Jessica mentioned, 2005, the Supreme Court decides the Brand X case, uh, upholds the agency's classification decision uh, as an information service. Um, what's the impact of that decision today? What, uh, you know, what, what uh, does that tell us about the authority the Commission has, and what does it tell us about the authority the Commission doesn't have? Jessica, you want to take a stab at it? Well, certainly it's a Supreme Court decision, so we hope that the FCC will pay <laughs> heed. I uh, feel duty-bound to say that. But I, I suspect it can be read in different ways, too. There are, there are probably people who look at it, on the one hand, as suggesting that it is more logical to look at these services as functionally integrated. And on the other hand, there will be people who look at it as chiefly a Chevron decision and it defines the outer boundaries of appropriate uh, decision-making by the FCC. Uh, in either case, I'm sure it's going to influence the way both the FCC and the Congress move ahead as they try to uh, identify a way forward for all these issues. Uh, Kevin, I don't have too much to add to, the, to what Jessica has said. I mean, it, is, it did, the, the majority opinion very clearly said this was a Chevron uh, 
analysis where they were deferring to the FCC and, and its analysis and, and its judgment about how these boundary lines should be drawn. It is kind of just as a footnote, very interesting to see how many people are quoting Scalia's dissent <laughs> from that decision as if that was the majority opinion. Um, and he certainly uh, put it much more colorfully uh, in his writing than the majority did. So it certainly deserves more airtime given the, the language that he used. It's more fun to read the dissent, but uh, the dissent did not carry the day in that in that instance. But having said that, if the FCC changes its mind and, and seems to have a, what the majority seem to say is as long as the FCC was making a reasonable decision based on its analysis of the marketplace that it would defer to the FCC's judgment, which then opens the door to the question, well, can the FCC then change it direction or alter that boundary line and draw it in a slightly different place based on an update of its analysis? And I think there's an argument that the Supreme Court decision would allow the FCC to do that, but again, within boundary lines. I mean, they can't totally uh, wipe out and start from a clean slate. I would suggest the Supreme Court and all the courts are going to look to see whether the FCC can build upon the body of work that it's done so far and make adjustments to that based on changes in the marketplace since then. Yeah, and that's, I mean, I think we'll get on the second panel into some right. more of these questions about uh, the, the proposed way of going forward. But I, I, I just want to try and make sure we, we complete the story in terms of how this has evolved. Um, Chairman Janikowski, uh, in, in announcing this, this third way proposal, said that, uh, to, to paraphrase, that there's, there's been a, a longstanding consensus, uh, some, some sort of bipartisan consensus, essentially, that uh, there's some baseline rules that should apply to broadband access service and, and uh, perhaps some similar set of services, um, but, but the agency shouldn't regulate too much, shouldn't uh, apply the, the full panoply of, of common carriage rules. Um, is that right? Is, 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 there, is there some core that, that we can look to and say, well, we may disagree fundamentally about how to get there and whether there's legislation needed or so forth, but um, there, there's some level of consensus or, or is that even saying too much? Well, um, you know, the computer two and computer three lines of decision do seem to establish a precedent for the, the third way. Uh, again, it's, it's not an exact situation because the technology has changed, but if you those d lines of decision from the FCC do seem to say that you can separate out the transmission component from the information services component. And that's what Computer 2 did with structural separation, Computer 3 did with ONA and, and CEI plans. So what they were trying to do is to say, yes, Bell companies could provide uh, an integrated package of information services and telecom services, but they also had to offer the telecom services component separately as a standalone measure to competing information service providers. So that seems to be uh, at, you know, at a very high level uh, uh, the kind of precedent that might be valuable, useful for the FCC to refer back to and the chairman, Janikowski, to look back to as he crafts this third way. Now again, it has to be updated with the new technology and it can't just be a, a complete replacement or, or, or rather complete um, uh, uh, you know, taking from the past and moving it in automatically to the present. But there is a principle there, there is a germ of a thought of, yes, you can separate out the telecom functions from the information services functions. But I think doctrinally that's actually a more revolutionary step than, than maybe John's characterizing it here. Mm -hmm. Because the core germ of, um, one of the core parts of even the, of the computer, deci computer decisions, computer inquiry decisions, certainly followed through in the, in the, in the post-96 Act jurisprudence was that the notion of telecommunication services and information services are mutually exclusive categories. You are one or the other, but you're not both. And it, it, in some ways, that is actually the seminal point in, in the jurisprudence. And that, it's not a, that's not a statute. I mean, the commission interpreted statute that way, but it, inter it interpreted statute that was not, it's not spelled out in statute that way. It, it, there were versions of the Communications Act, or the, of what became the 96 Act, that did in fact spell it out, and the, those provisions were dropped ultimately. Um, but it, you know, it, it's overturning that point. Can you be, and it, it sort of teed up directly here, which is, can you be both a tele, are you, not can you be, are you 
both a common carrier and an information provider when you offer an integrated internet access service to the public at large. I mean, Jessica, you, you have to deal with all of the, the politics, and so therefore I'm sure you're limited in what, what, what you can say. But um, it, it just, I mean, do, you, do you have a sense that there's, there, there's a room for consensus somewhere in the middle here? I think when you push all the political rhetoric aside, what you'll find is nobody, no matter where they sit on this debate, is really interested in applying a series of old-style telephone rules to newfangled broadband services. The important thing in the end is to identify not so much which title all of these services fit in as what your principles and priorities are as we head into this new communications world. How do we make sure that broadband is ubiquitous? How do we make sure that consumers are protected? How do we make sure that public safety officials, for instance, have the access to the networks they need? And then separately, how do we make sure that we provide proper incentives for private investment? And those principles probably should guide our dialogue more than some deeply embedded notion of what title these services best belong in. And so that's, I think, what we bring to it from the legislative perspective right now, or at least with my boss, we do. Mm -hmm. All right, so I'm going I'm to start, I'm going to invite people to ask uh, questions from the audience. We'll get a, uh, a microphone to come around. Um, let me see. Um, let's see. Well, while we're doing it, let me, let me just ask you one, one follow-up question, Jesse, I may, I may have to ask. So, so there, there was this announcement on Monday by, by your boss and the other committee chairman. Um, what can you say about what, where did that process come from and, and where is it likely to go? Uh, well, if April's not the cruelest month, it's a uh, complicated month for anyone who follows uh, telecommunications policy. And obviously, in the aftermath of the Comcast decision, a lot of time, energy, and effort has been expended at trying to identify just how the FCC, FCC should manage what that decision says and how it should look to broadband services in the future, especially in light of the recent efforts with the National Broadband Plan. So it was the thinking of what I would say are the four majority leaders in the Congress on these issues, which would be Senator Rockefeller, Senator Kerry on the Senate side, Congressman Waxman and Congressman Boucher on the House side, that they would harness all this energy and try to bring it into a single and more thoughtful forum so that we could work to identify ways, both small and large, that we could update the Communications Act. Now, that's clearly not a simple or easy task, but it is something that we think is compelled by the evolution of technology and has been accelerated by that Comcast decision. Get the mic up here. Uh, Chris and then, and then Link. Uh, yeah, front, the front row up here. And then and we'll, and we'll get, I'll get back to you in a second. So yeah, and just state your name and affiliation for the, for the record. Yeah, thank you. Hi, I'm Chris Savage. I, I'm with Davis Wright Tremaine, which is a law firm, but I'm not here on behalf of any particular client. Uh, I'd like to ask the panel a question that is probably boring and difficult as compared to interesting and fun, which is, as a practicing lawyer, all this policy stuff is great. But I've got this statute sitting in front of me. And I guess I'd like the panel's view of, suppose we don't change the law, and it's just what it is. Do you guys have any thoughts now that we understand more about how the internet works as to whether or not internet transmission is or isn't a telecom service? I'm not going to be able to help you, Chris. I'm sorry. <laughs> cer cer certainly not without a, without a fee, but uh, yeah. shout out. Yes, yeah, I, I charge people for my answer to this question. Yeah. I'm just trying to get it for free. But, no, but, but, right, but seriously, right. the, the question is, it, it, let's assume there's going to be, you know, it, by 2012, a, a, a comprehensive, thoughtful rewrite of the act that deals with all this. Nonetheless, we have a year or two of dealing with the laws that exist today. And, and, and I'm, I'm just very curious about people's thoughts about that, because that's, when I go back to the office, what I got to deal with is the laws that exist today. And, and I think it's, it's a bit of a judgment call. I don't think it's a, a black and white question. And I, I've seen some of the uh, discussion about DNS uh, lookup services being, you know, they were uh, initially categorized as an information services type of thing, but then you can make the argument that's very similar to telephone numbers and, and routing uh, basic common carrier features. So, uh, and 800 numbers, yes. Um, uh, 
but uh, I, I'm not qualified to weigh in on that. I'm sorry. Well, I, I think the answer doctrinally is, is pretty straightforward. Internet transmission or Internet service, Internet, internet transmission is not a telecommunication service. It's not, I mean, the, yeah, that's what the FCC's held to date, the, the BNS and other, other aspects of Internet access are not on telecommunication service. Whether the FCC changes its mind is a different different question. There's obviously a lot of difficult boundary cases the FCC is considering right now, whether MPLS is type services and should be considered information services or telecommunication services and you know that's, and under so under what circumstances or not and that's where you know people come to talk to people and Chris like me all the time but it's um, <laughs> it's you know that's doctrinally where we are I think the question is how the, the one of the questions opened up by the by the by the reopening of the of the debate over definitions is how much of that then gets thrown in a cocked hat and you have to and you do have to start revisiting those questions all over again. Uh, let's see. So Link and then and then uh, Link Cohen with Verizon and maybe ironically enough I can't tell you what a telecommunications service is either, despite the fact that I work for a telephone <laughs> company. Um, but there is one large elephant in the room, Kevin, that I think uh, is been totally ignored by this debate and it happens a lot in these debates, and that is that the cable industry was never treated as a common carrier. Uh, it always offered an integrated service, and at one point, it now offers voice service, but as far as I know, they didn't offer telecommunications in the early days either, and that gets totally ignored in this debate. Doesn't that crash into this whole thing in a big way? Isn't it an important part of it? I think I said that. I don't think I ignored it, Link. I think Beck said that one of the problems is that, that the computer, computer 2 construct divided the world into transmission layer, which would be a regulated common carrier service, and an information service, which would be unregulated, and in fact, one of the things that happened is the cable industry leapfrogged that, and the cable industry is doing both as a non-common carrier service. So yes, it is, it is the elephant in the room, but it's, it, it, you know, it's here. Let's, let, let, let's go, go back to the history. I mean, did John Winhausen, to, to what extent was that within the, the uh, mindset of the Congress, you think, in, in 96, that, that you'd have providers who were not historically common carriers being offering these kinds of services? Well, actually, you know, theoretically, what we were tr we were trying to stay technology neutral in the 1996 Act, and so we were trying to say the same rules should apply to all technologies, regardless of your history, but it should be more related to your your uh, your presence in the marketplace. So, for instance, in the uh, to divert to, for a second into Section 251 analysis of the unbundling provisions, you know, there's a very clear. Uh, 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 assumption, or not assumption, but clearly written into the act that whether the, uh, in that case, the ILAC is using fiber or wireless or other technologies, um, well, wireless is in uh, Title III, but regardless of the technologies you were supposed to apply the unbundling provisions, uh, regardless of how the call was rooted or what technologies were in particular. So that was sort of the flavor of the environment that we were trying to, to get away from the silos, to get away from your history, historical categorization, and treat the same services fairly and equally. That was, that was what we were trying to do. Now, did we succeed in doing that entirely? No, I don't think it, it was possible to completely succeed. I know the FCC also took that technology neutral approach as best it could, but um, you know, it's difficult to do, and you know, it's a long process to try to, to get there. Well, and, and the web of consequences of any statutory, com statutory classification make that difficult. So what was one, one of the impetus, it's not saying that it's the sole impetus at all, but one of the things that, that, that's out there is if you say that cable modem service was a telecommunications service, you potentially have immediately, immediate a implications for the application of the pole attachment rates. Universal right, and, uni well, and universal service, and those were clearly things that overhung that overhung some of the debates then and now. So I saw Scott Cleland on the right and then Mark Cooper on the left, just describing where you're sitting. <laughs> Very accurately. <laughs> uh, Scott Cleland, uh, netcompetition.org. Um, a uh, rather simple question, but you know, should the foundation of FCC regulatory authority, meaning the interpretation or reinterpretation of definitions, should that change like the FCC's definition of the public interest changes with basically what three votes at the FCC says it is at any given time. 
that a normative question or, or <laughs> what? I mean, I, I mean, it's a democracy. You have an election. You have three people who vote. I'm not quite sure what that means, but. Yeah. You know, to me, the question is, would you rather have the FCC making those decisions or members of Congress making those decisions? And, well, and you know. The question was that Congress already did make these decisions in the sense of having telecom information services. And so, uh, and or, or the courts. I mean. I'm just wondering, the main thrust of the question is, is it a good policy to uh, change a trajectory that every you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in investment and business models have been set, and then all of a sudden, Okay, Scott. Yeah. This is like 500. This is like 500 years of debate about the importance of stare decisis. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and I mean, uh, we understand your view, and that's I mean, it's part of. We'll get to more into this in in the second panel. I think we want to try and keep this a little more focused on the the, the background. Yeah. This conversation has, in fact, sure, I'm sorry, Mark. Just just introduce yourself for the for the recording. Yeah. Oh, Mark Cooper, Consumer Federation. Um, the, the discussion has properly reflected the actual history of the way this issue has unfolded over 10 years. That is, the entire discussion has been about interconnection and carriage, or transmission, uh, which were the essence of what has gone on. The question I have is that there are at least four other public interest principles in Title II that are now clearly implicated. Universal service, privacy, access for consumers with disabilities, and consumer protection, which in fact have received almost no vetting in the regulatory and judicial process that led us to this point in time. If those four issues are now entered either at the regulatory agency or before the courts, how does that change the consideration, particularly with the question of changing one's mind? Because if the regulatory agency and the courts never considered four-fifths of the implications of their decision, then you're really not changing your mind. You're making a de novo decision in 80% of the issues that the agency should have considered uh, in making the original decision. Well, I, I guess I'm not quite sure the factual premise is right. Um, if you think about the Stevens report, the Stevens report was asked, asked for specifically because of concerns about universal service. I mean, if, if universal, and the one thing that was front and center in the late 90s discussions, in addition to issues of non-discrimination, which were certainly on the table because the cable open access debate was going on in its sort of either first or first and a half generation, um, there, the universal service was, cl was, was, clearly, was clearly there. I, I do think that issues like disabilities access have gotten less discussion because of, in, in, that, in, that, in that context, but, but universal service has clearly been part of the discussion since the beginning. If you look at the uh, broadband wireline decision, the one that sort of rounded everything up and finished it off, there were 50 pages devoted to transmission and one page devoted to universal service. And that one page said, we're gonna have to think about this. And that proceeding has never been completed nor have the other three proceedings. So to say that it was considered, the Stevens report said we care about universal service and uh, then it disappears from the stage. Go back and look at the record. There's almost no examination of, of the implications for universal service up to and concluding the last official document which said, boy, we better think about this and never did. I guess I would think there have been lots of examination of the issue. I think that there has not been a, I mean, the conclusion has not been to apply universal service assessment to stand alone, to stand alone, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to integrated uh, offerings of, broad, of, of internet access capability, but it's certainly is something that's been examined. Well, let, let, me, let me try and, and rephrase and, and redirect a little uh, what, what I think Mark was going. I mean, should this be predominantly a competition telecom policy debate, or, or, or should it be broader? I mean, John, you, you made reference to this sort of very broad kind of two, two categories of, of regulation or, or, or not, uh, which clearly sweeps in a lot of other kinds of issues. Uh, is that the right way for us to be, to be framing it? Uh, you know, is Mark right that we should take into consideration these broader concerns? Uh, oh, oh, I think so. I mean, I think that's an argument that you, you 
do need to uh, uh, evaluate the full panoply of provisions and effects on the on consumers in the marketplace that will result from any any uh, attempt to to change the definitions or uh, how you apply the definitions. So, in other words, what I'm saying is, the the court decision, the Comcast case uh, that came out is understandable that the court was only considering that particular facts of that case brought before it. And that's certainly what courts do, is evaluate only that. But the, the danger of that court decision is that it did say that it would make this evaluation on a case-by-case -case basis. And so that means, sets up a process uh, to continue to have to go back to the courts every single time there's a consumer protection issue or an, or an issue with disabilities or an issue with all the other provisions that Mark just mentioned have to be reevaluated on a case-by-case -case basis. Well, that's a tremendous waste to society as a whole because of all the litigation costs that are incurred. I think, so what I'm trying to say is that is an argument for the FCC, I think, trying to look at the whole piece of this and all the different pieces together in a more comprehensive way to come up with a, an approach to these regulatory definitions uh, in a way that's going to make the most sense looking at, across the board at universal service and disabilities access and, um, and, and the marketplace of, of all, all these different kinds of marketplaces. Jessica, do you have any sense of, of the extent to which those other universal service, privacy, and so forth will, will be part of the, the process on the Hill? Yeah, I think Mark's point is that classification has consequences, and he's right. In terms of a legislative perspective, perhaps the interest is less strong in precisely which title of the statute these services fit in than whether or not we create a structure that is capable of delivering the public goods that members care about like, for instance, universal service privacy protection, ensuring that the disabled have access to a uh, baseline of services and the like. So those priorities, I think, will be more prominent in the legislative process than they've been in the recent regulatory discussion. Other questions? By the way, Kevin, just one other comment, if I may. Just as an exercise, I think it's kind of fun to think back as we're uh, looking at these issues, not at what the 90 1996 Act contained, but what <clears throat> the, the 1934 Act was all about. Now go back and put your minds, uh, put yourself in the minds of the legislators who were drafting that Act, which set out the broad parameters of how communications policy should be regulated or not. And you know, it's an interesting, it can lead to it's an interesting exercise, an interesting thought process. Mark Brodsky from Public Knowledge, and I've actually done that. Uh, I don't know if you remember Max Paglin's book that he came out with some years ago, which reprinted the, um, some of the hearings from the 34 Act. And some of that stuff about getting telegraph services out to rural areas and how it was too expensive and they couldn't possibly do it. And talking about reserving public interest spectrum for people other than broadcasters, I mean, it just carries right through. So that, that, I've done that exercise and it's mm -hmm. a lot of fun. Yeah. But that wasn't the question. The question is, um, I'm, I'm fascinated by this tension between, on one hand, principles, and on the other hand, let's call it marketplace. On one hand, you have sort of a, you know, a relatively timeless non-discrimination principle, you know, call it the 201, 202 part. And then, Jessica, you're just talking about the need to make sure investment isn't hampered. How do you, which, what, does one of those trump the other? I don't think so, but I uh, candidly will acknowledge that it is difficult to try to reconcile the two. And uh, at least on the Senate side, add 100 senators in, and it's even more complex. <laughs> <laughs> Which is one of the reasons that a lot of these issues do get deferred to a regulatory agency with unelected individuals who can contemplate and think a little bit more deeply about what the right structure should be. But we may be reaching the ends of how appropriate it is for them to continue to do that under the current statute. I guess we can go back to, to Chris and to Scott, and no one else wants to ask questions. <laughs> oh, yeah, and then, oh, okay, then you'll I'll ask a history, history question then. And uh, John, you were there for when uh, Chairman Kennard decided, uh, struggled with this question that we're struggling with, and you said it always comes back. Can you give us more color on why he thought it wasn't a good idea to apply um, Title II services to information services? Well, rather than comment on what Bill thought or not thought, um, <laughs> since I think the FCC rules don't allow me to do that, um, I, I, I mean, I think what, what, what the 
what's laid out in the Stevens report discussion really is a, um, and, and, you know, and you really see through in some ways some of the findings in Section 230 and things, that there was a predominant notion that the Internet should be left unregulated. Um, and that, that sort of overall impulse was certainly in the, in the air in, in 1999, and it wasn't, it was, you know, there, was, there were good reasons behind it, some of which we've talked about earlier, but also because just the market was evolving incredibly, the marketplace was evolving in, incredibly quickly. Um, and you know, the, the choice at the time was, is it not to go down the road of classifying all transmission as title as a title as a title to service and then and, and then forbearing and there were a lot of different types of transmission that were being offered even then as non common carrier in, in non common carrier forms and I think that that's you know you, you you have to go back and look at that as historical context um, but it's also you know you, no decisions are made in the, in, a, in a vacuum um, you know, we did not grow up in a, we did not come up in a world where all transmission uh, was was treated as a regulated service, and it, we also did not come up in a world where Congress rewrote. You know, unlike the EU, where there was earlier um, legislative attempts to try to uh, create a more harmonized regime, you know, that didn't happen in the United States. Okay, I want to make a question, and then we'll get back. Um, so just trying to capture a little bit of, of, of what I heard that I think is useful to focus on and then focus you on the one thing that the fifth part of what Mark left out, which is competition and what's changed. Um, if I read, John, the story you're telling, John uh, Wienerhaus, uh, uh, um, uh, that I'm uh, uh, of a trajectory of a basic problem, which is to say you have components of the service that are not competitive because of entry barriers, because of a set of classes of stable problems, and components that are competitive, enhanced services, at the time it was also um, uh, CPE, it was also long distance, and trying to solve that tension between competitive and uncompetitive as a way of not that there's a basic long-term tension between non-discrimination and non-regulation, but rather that in order to get a well-functioning market, you need to take and separate out those parts of the uh, service that are hard to build a competitive market on, and those parts that are easy, and try as best you can to narrow your regulation only to those parts that need it in order to allow competition and move away from the others. In that regard, like electricity, we've got generation, we've got transmission, we've got toasters. They're all connected to the electrical system, but we understand, and they all use electricity, but we understand them as having different market proposals. So where I see John Nakahata going into the details of what the argument was here and what was there, it seems to me that there's a basic line in the historical line that you're drawing, that there's this genuinely difficult set of markets to deal with that combine really stably stubborn problems that aren't amenable to competition and things that are. And that the role of an expert agency, unlike something that stands on stare decisis, is to um, look, okay, we tried this for a decade. Did it work? Didn't it work? What percentage of the market has real competition? What doesn't? Let's go back and look at it. That's the trajectory that I'm hearing here, and I wonder whether you agree. Um, let me see if I uh, understand and, and you know, reinterpret, uh, or maybe put it in my own words. So, it's very difficult to draw that line, yes, between the, the two uh, types of markets and the two types of services and categories that we're talking about. Um, and no matter where you draw the line, there are going to be some really close calls and judgment calls, and people are going to complain on one side if they fall on one side or the other of the line. Um, and, and those people will say, oh, this regulatory thing doesn't make any sense. But I would submit the, the fact that it's difficult to draw a line doesn't mean that you should get rid of the line. You know, what that means is that you shouldn't get, you wouldn't want to therefore regulate everything, 
And you also wouldn't want to deregulate everything because if most observers, I believe, uh, people can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think most observers believe that c general computer two, computer three uh, decisions were very successful in promoting the internet and promoting the availability of enhanced in information services because it set some basic rules of the road that all entrepreneurs and internet providers could could get access to the basic network and then build upon it with new and innovative services. So I think that general framework was, was the right one. Now, where the, the exact line you draw is, is going to be difficult and, and going to lead to litigation and, and debates and, and frustration for those who are right on that line. But in general, stepping back, looking at the big picture, you know, I think there is value in drawing a line somewhere. And I'm not an expert to say exactly where that line should or shouldn't be drawn. Um, but it, it, there does seem to be a value in drawing that line. Yeah, and I think the, I mean, I think what you describe is the general regulatory or deregulatory project. That is right, d trying to distinguish areas where the market functions and delivers the social goods that you want, and from areas where it does doesn't. Um, classification, of course, is a clumsy tool in that because it, the, at least in terms of the way the FCC statute works, Communications Act works, because it's a Classification generally tends to be an on-off switch, you know, with that, that can only be mitigated to some extent with, with, the, with the application of forbearance. Um, I think the other part of that reality, though, is that the FCC and, and the regulators in general have had a hard time dealing with um, oligopoly competition issues rather than monopoly competition issues. And so the, the, the regulatory tools is, were, were crafted really with the idea of monopoly in mind and don't necessarily work as well in, 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 in oligopolistic settings. You know, the, the, a good example of this was in the long distance industry where people were concerned at, at one point about having only a few large players and having people be able to use the tariff mechanism to price signal and raise prices in the marketplace. Uh, among among a couple of players, and in fact, that led to the FCC abolishing the tariff the tariffing mechanism for the long distance market. So, I mean, it, it, is, it is a the, the means by which you control market power um, from a regulatory standpoint. I think are not as clear in, in when you're dealing with with oligopoly. Let me just try on a follow up, and then we'll, we'll get to, to Rick. Um, it would seem to me, though, at least as a purely descriptive matter, the the exercise that the commission has been undergoing the last 14 years or so on, on this issue is, is, is predominantly this, this classification question. Is, is It's in one bucket or the other, and that, that gets to these questions that you described, John, about the, the worry about putting it in the, the regulated Title II bucket, whereas it seems like now both the uh, approach that the Martin Commission took in the, in the Comcast decision of, of, of trying to construct some theory under Title I and, and the one that, that Chairman Janikowski has proposed, the, the so-called third way, are, are attempts to to segment, to do something more like what Yochai is talking about and say, you know, th this, this is a category of things that we should apply one set of rules and this is a different category of things. Uh, is, does that sound right in terms of something that's at least different in the nature of the, the enterprise now versus over the historical period? Hmm. Yeah, I, 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 always, I always love to sup the panel when I'm yeah. moderating. So <laughs> Kevin, let me, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand the question, if it could be rephrased. The, the, question, the, question, the question is, is it, is it fair to say that most of the effort at the FCC, most of the fight on broadband internet regulation uh, has been about either or, Title I, information service, largely unregulated, Title II, telecommunication service, traditionally regulated, it, whereas now at least the effort over the last year, um, both under Chairman Martin and under Chairman Janikowski, seems to be about can we, can we piece out uh, elements of either of them based on market conditions and, and, and dynamics that, that may suggest something more nuanced? Or, or was that what they were trying to do all along? I've stopped well, the panel. All right. <laughs> I mean, here at the you know, my, my view is that it, that's, that's what people have been doing all along. Okay. I mean, you see it in... I mean, like I said, uh, Senator Stevens and Burns talked about for use, okay. use of Title II and forbearance. The active debate at the, at the FCC at the, time, you know, at the time of the cable modem decision and the, and the wireline broadband internet access order was a debate between 
uh, uh, non-regulated Title One and in uh, Title or, or Title One plus some restrictions and information and Title Two with forbearance. So I, I think it's just we may be in the third repeat of the of the proposals rather than okay. than, than really. I mean, I, with, with with some variations at each phase. So it's not like everything's completely the same. Okay, let's take one or two more, then then wrap up the big curious. Uh, much of the focus just, this morning, I'm sorry, just an I'm answer sorry, Rick, with, with Google. Um, much of the focus this morning has been on kind of the market power or market concentration type analysis as the basis for drawing lines. Um, I wonder, since this is the panel looking at history, the other prongs of common carriage, I think, maybe hold some relevance as well. Namely, if you kind of look back and the writings of people like Brett Frischman and Barbara Cherry and, and Susan Crawford, there are other elements here in addition to market power. One is this notion of sort of an essential input whether it's transportation infrastructure or communications infrastructure going back hundreds of years, that's something that the courts and the regulators and certainly Congress have found to be important considerations. The other is the use of, uh, of public resources, rights of way, poll attachments, uh, spectrum, which is, of course is a national resource. Uh, to what extent do you think either this FCC or a future Congress will, would or should take these kinds of considerations uh, you know, as, as they're looking to debate the, the question of how to draw these lines? Um, Rick, those are all uh, key components of the analysis. I agree that they should be factored into the FCC's review. I mean, this is, I think, another reason why it's helpful to have a comprehensive look um, at, across the board at all of these factors. Um, it, the, the common carrier functionality, I mean, that, that whole concept uh, is really unrelated. Uh, the duty to serve everyone is really unrelated to your market power position. I mean, that's, that's tied to if you're offering yourself out to the public, then you have these certain obligations to serve the public in an indiscriminate way. That's whether you have market power or not, at least according to that, my understanding of that, that historical line of thought and that basic uh, principle. Um, so it's not just a market power analysis. You're right. Uh, market power analysis may have more to do with once you define it and categorize it, okay, how much of the regulations would apply to you in that category? And, and you can argue that you can adjust the amount of regulation based on the market position, but also the other factors like rights of way use and spectrum use, those also have to be taken into account as well. All right, well, let me ask, let me ask all of you one, one final question, and then, and then we'll wrap up this session, which is, uh, so we've, we've been talking about history. Let's, let's flip it around. Uh, if we get back together again in, say, 14 years, um, will we still be having this debate? Or, or, or is, there, is there hope that, that we'll be on to another, another stage? Depends on how successful Jessica and her boss are. <laughs> well, as a congressional staffer, I'll just say that's above my pay grade. <laughs> Well, you've, you've heard me say this earlier on. I, I do think we're likely to be revisiting this question for many years to come um, because of, there are two very, very significant, important principles that are at stake here, and both of them are very valuable. They've been with us for many, many years, and they're likely to continue to be value uh, to us uh, many years in the future. Uh, I know in the 1996 Act, what we were hoping uh, it didn't turn out this way, but what we were hoping is to create such a much more competitive landscape for basic telecommunication services that the kind of debates we're having now would be much different today and in the future, uh, that you wouldn't have this market power would not be a as, as much of an issue. And, and maybe we'd only be thinking about the issues that Rick just mentioned and Mark just mentioned before. But we're not in that universe. So um, you know, predictions 14 years from now, uh, will we have a more competitive marketplace than we do today? Well, I hope so, but I'm not ready to guarantee that. I, I tried that once 14 years ago. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, well, we'll bring you all back in uh, 2024. We'll, we'll book this same room if it's still here. Um, please join me thanking the panelists for this great discussion. Thank you.